Uh, it's great to be with you. I so love hearing you sing and worship the Lord, and uh, it's a joy to do that with you together because we get to come before the Lord and praise Him in spirit and in truth. Amen? And it's a beautiful thing when you really uh, begin to look at the Word of God and you begin to reflect on the holiness of God, the goodness of God, that there's hope in Christ. And, uh, you know, salvation is an interesting conversation because salvation, we tend to think of the word saved and we immediately go back uh, to when we got saved or we think about people that need to be saved. But the truth of the matter is, is it means rescue, to be rescued. And believers, guess what? <laughs> There's times we need to be rescued because we get caught in a web and we've got to come before the Lord and agree with him and confess to him and acknowledge to him the reality of a situation that he's trying to let us know about. And in the midst of that, there's always hope because God's a good God. He's a great God. We're going to look at uh, 1 John and we're going to look at chapter 1, verses 8 and 9. We're talking about true freedom and, and we're dealing with sin and sin's never an easy thing to deal with. Uh, it's a challenging issue in many, many ways. I remember uh, years ago, I love baseball. My Phillies lost yesterday and I'm depressed about it. I'm, I'm like, man, what are these guys? They had an epic year and now they came out. <sighs> anyway, that's another story, another song, another dance. But we were, my brother and I were at a, um, a little league field. We were young. I was turning 12. So that next year I was going to be playing against some of the kids that was uh, a game was taking place. And so we had gone down to the park, we were shooting some hoops and we saw a game start and we went over there. I said, Dave, let's, let's go over there. I wanna see these guys cause I'm gonna be playing against them next year and I wanna see how good they are, right? Scout it out. Well, my dad had very specifically told us, be home at five o'clock. You got that boys? Be home at five o'clock. We were like, yes, dad, yes, sir, absolutely, 100%, no problems, no issues, we'll be home at five o'clock, okay. So we get there, we start watching this game, we're sitting in the bleachers, and suddenly, light bulb went on. I wonder what time it is. Dad said to be home at five o'clock. Now, I know you've never done this before, <laughs> So I reached down, there was a gentleman in front of us, an older gentleman, and I tapped him on the shoulder. I said, sir, I said, do you happen to have the time? Because I saw that he had a huge watch on. So I knew it was a pretty safe bet that he had the time. You know what I'm saying? And he looks at me and he goes, whoa, how you doing, young man? I looked at my brother, how you doing? You guys doing good? Yeah, you enjoying the game? Yeah, we're enjoying the game. We're like, he looks down and he goes, it's five till five, something like that. He turned back around, starts watching. And I looked at Dave. I said, ah, let's watch the game. We'll just tell him we forgot. We'll just tell him we forgot. Well, sure enough, <laughs> you got to meet Carver, right? So about half an hour later, <laughs> here comes my sister tracking across. I could see her all the way down. I thought, oh boy, here we go. You know, here comes Carver. She goes, where have you guys been? Where have you? She's not expressive at all. Where have you been? Where have you been? Dad's upset. He so he so told you guys you'd be home at five o'clock. We're like, oh, we forgot. We forgot. I'm so sorry. We forgot. So we get on our bikes. We track home. We get home. Dad's like, I told you to be home at five o'clock. What's wrong? Why didn't you guys ask somebody? No, oh, it's oh, we sorry, Dad. We're so sorry. It's like okay, okay, don't do it again. We're like okay, great. Two days later. Oh man, God has a way of getting you. I've never forgotten this. I, I literally can put myself back on those bleachers. I can replay this thing in my mind like I was literally whatever age I was, 11, 12 years old, sitting there like as if it were today. He comes home, and I remember him looking at me. And he had that look. And I thought, uh-oh, what did I do, you know? And he said, so you were at the game the other day at the park. I said, yeah. And you didn't know what time it was. I said, no, Dad, we forgot, we forgot. He said, you know, it's a funny thing. He said, I have a patient. He's a doctor. He said, I have a patient that came into the office today. And he started telling me about two boys that were sitting behind him watching a baseball game. 
and how polite they were when they asked him what time it was. Oh, have you ever had that happen? Oh, be so, sure your sin will find you out, man. That guy didn't print it into my brain like really quickly right at that moment, right? It was like automatic. I was like, Dad, we're sorry. We're so we were just watching the game. And he just stood there and looked at us. Boy, he let us sweat it out, you know? Oh, my word. You know, sin is not really, in that sense, a, a funny thing. We all have a sin nature. There's no big eyes and little eyes at the cross. We all need Jesus, don't we? And that's true. And the Lord rescues us. We can look back on moments like that, and, I, and we laugh about it, and it's okay. I laugh about it too now. And my dad's in heaven tomorrow. So he would have been 83 tomorrow. He's with the Lord, and I know that he's laughing about it too at some level because he knows God <laughs> used it in my life, and thank God for that. But there is a truth for believers that we've got to be very careful not to get trapped, not to get enslaved. And that's one thing we want to look at today, because walking with the Lord Jesus Christ, we have freedom in him. We have freedom in him and only in him. When we walk according to the flesh, according to darkness, as John would put it, then we don't have fellowship with God. We don't have fellowship with his son. We don't have fellowship with one another. We're not walking in freedom. When we walk with the Lord and we walk in the light and we walk in his truth, we have fellowship with him. We have fellowship with his son. The blood of Christ is cleansing us as we walk in this fallen, dirty world. And we're able to have, as a result, fellowship with one another, true fellowship. And that's essential. I think all of us want that. I want that. But there's times where there's something inside of us that Satan knows is there and we get tempted and suddenly something in us begins to get pulled out and we make decisions that are not according to the will of God, that are not according to God's way. And as a result, we need to confess. And we're going to look at that. It's one of the most famous verses probably in Scripture for believers. It's an amazing thing when we begin to look at this in 1 John. He says this, If we say that we have no sin, we are deceiving ourselves and the truth is not in us. And if we confess our sins, he's faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Wow, there's a lot of hope in this. A couple weeks from now, we'll get to verse 10. If we say that we've not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. Now, he's writing to believers, folks, and I think this is essential to understand. The idea that John is writing to unbelievers for them to become believers or that somehow this is an evangelistic tool that John is trying to use for unbelievers to become believers, the, the, folks, that's just so non-contextual. And one of the main things that you know, the reason that it's not contextual is because John includes himself. If we, think about that. The Apostle John has no doubts about his salvation. None. He's actually writing this letter to believers. And in 1 John 5, 13, he says, These things I have written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God. He's writing to believers. Why? So that you may know that you have eternal life. In other words, as a believer... Even though you're dealing with sin and you have tripping and stumbling and you have to run to the Lord and ask for confession and get cleansing from him, you've had the whole bath. You don't have to doubt your eternal security. That's essential for believers because the lack of security for believers is deadly. And we have to come before the Lord and walk in the reality of what God has declared us to be, not what we do for God in order to prove ourselves. That leads to very unhealthy paths. He's writing to believers. He wants to help guard us from walking in darkness, to guard us from walking in that which is not true. In other words, sin, but rather to walk with him in his light, in other words, truth. And he's made clear, believers, this is so important to understand. When we get saved and we are justified at the point of salvation, we are considered to be holy in him in the sense that we are set apart. And glorification is a promised moment. And, we, and praise God for that. But there is this thing called sanctification. 
And that's the idea of becoming holy. In other words, we are becoming what God has declared us and promised us that one day we will be. And so we need to walk with the Lord. We need to yield to him. We still have a sin nature, and John makes this clear, even though we're saved. And John's very emphatic on this point. To deny this is to deny God's word. And ultimately, in verse 10, it's literally to say that he's lying about us. That's amazing. Well, we can be deceived, folks. And we can even decide or deceive ourselves and as a result be out of fellowship with God, even though we're his sons, we're his daughters. We can be out of fellowship with one another. And that's sad because the Lord doesn't want that. The Lord wants us to enjoy fellowship with him and one another in truth, which is what really walking in freedom is all about. But unfortunately, we live in a sinful world and we continue to have sin natures. One day we're going to get rid of this body of death and thank God for that. And as a result, we're going to be pure even as he is pure. We're going to be holy as he is already holy and in the meantime, we continue to need cleansing from sin. And that's absolutely essential. There, there's nobody perfect here, including me. We all need Jesus, folks. And that's just the truth. So let me give you two things, because I'm on a roll with two things. I, I don't know why, but I am. Persuaded by God's truth and participating in God's work. Right? So the first thing is we got to be persuaded, right? He says, if we say that we have no sin, we are deceiving ourselves and the truth is not in us. That, that idea of if we say, he, he's not creating a hypothetical that is some ethereal philosophical thing that nobody can. He's literally saying, hey, believer, this may not have happened, but it's a very real possibility that it could happen in your life. And this is the second of three times that John makes this supposition. He says it in verse 6 where he says, if we say we have fellowship. He says it here if we say we have no sin. And he says it in verse 10 if we say we have not sinned. So the idea of if we're walking in darkness and we say we're in the light, well, then there's no, we've broken fellowship with God as believers. Here, he's saying, if you say that you have no sin, you literally are deceiving yourself. The truth is not in you. He's not saying you're not a believer. He's saying you're not allowing the truth of God to direct you. You're not allowing God's word to lead you. You're not yielded to the Lord. If you say you have no sin, you are literally deceiving yourself and you are not allowing the truth of what God has said to go before you, to energize you, to empower you, to in effect lead you forward. Because he's writing to believers on this issue. If you say you have no sin, we're deceiving ourselves. The word deceive is to lead astray to go the wrong way, to wander off the path, so to speak. You, you literally are taking God's word and you're saying, oh, thanks, I got a better way. And all of a sudden you start going down that way and guess what it leads to? It leads to enslavement. It doesn't lead to anything good. And folks, we're all susceptible to this. Why do you think it's so important that we're in the Word of God, that we're under the authoritative teaching of the Word of God? Why do you think the Word of God is so essential in our lives and the Holy Spirit begins to enlighten us, to illumine the Word of God, to teach us what God's Word says? And it's not just about a bunch of facts. It's about how it applies to my life now in the midst of the circumstances the Lord has allowed me to be within. See, this is where we need the Lord desperately. We need to walk with them. Sin is never to be trifled with. It's never to be trifled with. We don't want to mix our walk with the Lord and at the same time walk in darkness. It's, it's not God's will for any of us to do that. We can deceive ourselves. And I love the fact, if I could say it this way, that John includes himself. Folks, if the Apostle John, the beloved Apostle, who walked with Jesus, saw him, was convinced of who he is, laid his head on his shoulder, was 
absolutely aware of all that the Lord had done, what he thought. I mean, just the list goes on. If the Apostle John saying, if we and ourselves, we can fall into this trap. We've got to be careful about this. Fellow believers, how should we not listen to what one of our great leaders has said? we got to be careful about this. And we need to help one another with grace, with love, and with truth. Now he says, we have no sin, we're deceiving ourselves, the truth is not in us. And again, this isn't the idea that we're not saved, it's the idea that God's truth is not guiding us, directing us. We are not listening to his wisdom. We are walking according to our own thinking rather than what he has to say. And folks, that is not freedom. That's slavery. And that's exactly why God saved us, rescued us out of the past into what we have the opportunity of walking with him today. Well, let me unpack this just a little bit more. How can we become deceived? You know, there's different levels of it, right? Corporately, as a church body, people can be deceived, right? We can uh, be deceived as individual families. We can certainly personally be deceived. I would suggest, and I, I heard this, it's always interesting how the Lord orchestrates services. You, you can't make it up. But I heard this at least twice today in terms of keeping our eyes on the Lord. I said it myself earlier. But one of the things that happens when we become deceived is we have gotten our eyes off the Lord. And, and what happens when we get our eyes off the Lord? Well, one of the things that happens, this is in a comprehensive list, but Think about this. Our all of his salvation begins to fade. His grace seems deserved. And grace is never deserved. Catch me? Never is grace deserved. We never earn God's favor. Ever. Otherwise, it's no longer grace. Grace is grace because it's never earned. It's never earned prior to salvation to get saved, and it's never earned by believers to walk in the freedom of Christ. It is grace, and that's essential to understand. What happens, we get our eyes off the Lord, and we start getting our eyes on us. We start getting our eyes on our work. We start getting our eyes on the circumstances, and we have suddenly become something that we're actually not. And we begin to deceive ourselves. Secondly, we stop trusting the Lord. We walk by sight rather than faith. Oh, anybody been there? It's tough, isn't it? It's tough. I could go through the laundry list. <laughs> and I'm going to tell you something. There's nothing that I would ever say to you that I haven't struggled with myself. The reason I know it so well is because I've lived it. <laughs> so no big eyes and little eyes at the feet of the cross, foot of the cross. Right? We get our eyes off the Lord. We start to think that grace is deserved. We stop trusting the Lord. We begin to walk by sight rather than faith because our confidence is in ourselves and what we can do for God instead of recognizing there's nothing we can do for God. John 15, instead, in spite of agreeing with the Apostle Paul, where he says, who is adequate for these things? Who is adequate for these? If the Apostle Paul can say who's adequate for these things, who are we to say that we're adequate? Think about that. And thirdly, we can experience success in Christ and begin to take credit for what God has done. Oh, we would never do that. Oh, really? Oh, yeah, we do. We love it. We love it. We love it. Look at all I've done. You can't help but slip it. Did you have your devotions this morning? You know what I learned today? You know what I, man, it was for three hours that I had my devotions. And, and it's all good if your heart is pure and sharing what God taught you that morning. But a lot of times what happens is it seems like everybody's kind of like, huh. Look at me. Look how many people I witnessed to. Look how much money I've given. Oh, I mean, the list goes on. We've got to guard against that because we can become deceived in thinking that we're something really other than what we really are. We can begin to tolerate sin in our own lives and within our church family, and folks, we cannot do that. With grace, with love, 
Do you know biblical tolerance is not the way that the world wants to make it out to be. Biblical tolerance is that we accept you where you are, but we don't want to leave you there. Do you catch that? The world's view of tolerance is go live whatever way you want. It doesn't matter. We quote unquote tolerate you, with it, which is nonsense anyway, when you really get right down to it. But that's what they say. But as believers, we say, no, 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 no. We, we love you. We accept. It's okay. Where you are right now, that's okay. Christ can make a difference. Jesus can make a difference. Let's walk together. And let me share with you what God has done in my life and what he can do in your life because we don't want to leave you there. Did you catch that? That's biblical tolerance. Well, we become complacent and comfortable in our walk with the Lord, and we stop doing some basic things. Right? We're hardened to what God's Word has to say. We don't spend time in prayer like we ought to. Our fellowship with one another begins to be temporal rather than eternal. Church becomes... A convenience. A convenience. Oh, boy, we could laundry list this. Question is, are we walking in God's light? Are we walking in the truth? Warren Wiersbe puts it this way, light produces life and growth and beauty. But sin is darkness. And darkness and light cannot exist in the same place. If we're walking in the light, the darkness has to go. If we're holding the sin, then the light goes. There's no middle ground, no vague gray area where sin is concerned. Amen. That's challenging for all of us, or it should be. Because we all can deceive ourselves at some level. Are we persuaded by God's truth? Are we persuaded that what God has said is true about me. Forget about everybody else, about me. And are we willing to walk with our Lord in humility based on his grace in faith? Well, secondly, are we willing to participate in God's work? You know, because only the Lord can cleanse us. Amen? Only the Lord can cleanse us. And he says in verse 9, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. The word confess is, a, is an awesome word. We use this word all the time. It's such a cool word. It has the idea of something that is similar, something that is the same, and to say something that is similar or that is the same. To say is to say something intelligently. It comes from our word. We get Lego from it, right? Legos. My son loved Legos, loved Legos, Star Wars Legos, man. He put together stuff that I, I, was, <laughs> I was in awe. I was like, wow, you did that? He's like, yeah, Dad, I love it, I love it, right? What was he doing? He was putting things together in an intelligent way in order to craft something that was amazing. When we talk about speech, we're talking about saying something that has intelligence to it. And in this case, it's God's intelligence. It's what God has to say. We're agreeing with what he has said. We're not coming up with it. We're simply agreeing with him. And that's what confession is. Confession is an agreement with the Lord. Yes, Lord, I, I, I agree with you. What you've pointed out to me in my life is sin. And would you forgive me for it? Would you cleanse me of it? That's the point. If we confess our sins, again, he uses this idea. It's something very real. It's something very much of an opportunity for believers. We have the privilege of walking in this. The question is, are we going to be convinced to do it? If it's not automatic, we, we have to say, I, I agree, Lord. I, I hear what you're saying. I want to listen more. And Lord, would you do this in my life? Because only you can. If we say, or if we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous. And I love that. Faithful means trustworthy, to be counted on. Isn't that great? There's hope in that, folks. <laughs> Our Lord is faithful. He's trustworthy. He can be counted on. He's righteous. It means he's always doing what is right, what is correct. He's always fair. He never does 
anything contrary to what is just or contrary ultimately to his nature. And there's a lot of hope in that. Because we can run to our Father and we can bend the knee. We can agree with him in what he's letting us know. And what does he say? He's faithful. He is righteous to do what? Forgive us our sins. The word forgive means to throw them away, to send them away, to dismiss them. Isn't that cool? I'll never forget as I got caught in this moment with my dad. <laughs> I don't know what it was because my dad, uh, he, he believed in discipline, you know, and I'm thankful I needed it. But for some reason, that particular time, in spite of the fact that we had literally lied blatantly bold-faced multiple times, he, he kind of had grace with my brother and me. And he looked at us and he said, you know, guys, he said, you got caught in a lie. And I want you to know I love you. And I want you to know that's not what's best for you. Please don't do that again. You can trust me. You can come to me and let me know if you've done something wrong. I remember it to this day. Made a mark. Made a mark. It's like not only is God faithful to help expose what needs to be exposed, but God is faithful to kindly trustworthy in his essence and in terms of who he is with righteousness to come alongside of us in grace and to say that that's not the best thing trust me walk with me follow me experience what i can do and he throws away our sins he throws them away you know it's eris tense not the borea eris tense is punctilier means at a particular point in time but there's something called the progressive heiress. Then there's something called where the heiress can continue. It's like taking a picture, right? Uh, sometimes we have movie cameras and all that kind of stuff. We got our iPhones. I can, I can take all kinds of pictures, right? Steph got up today. She's all excited because the balloons were out. What does she do? Whoosh, got that thing. Well, there's two different kinds of pictures you can take. You can take a video. And what does that do? It captures everything that's happening in time, and it's continuous. That's present tense. The heiress tense is kind of the old way of doing this thing. It's like the snapshot. There's a snapshot. Completed action. There's the picture. Whoop. Oh, look at that one. Oh, I see one of the special balloons. Wow, oh, that's pretty cool. Wow, oh, that didn't come out as clear as I wanted it to come out. That's okay. Let's take another one. Take another one. Take another one. Take another one. Heiress tense. Think about this. Every time the Lord comes to me and lets me know that I have sinned and I have the <laughs> willingness to come before him and say, Lord, I agree with you. It's true. Every time, every moment, he will cleanse. 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 And he never stops. It never gets old to him. He doesn't get tired of it. He doesn't throw his hands up in heaven and go, oh, my word, this kid of mine, Eric, I can't believe he's done this again. Do you know that? Because he loves us unconditionally. He cares for us beyond anything we could even begin to begin to, to, to say it, to put into words. We, we tend to walk in fear. We tend to, oh, I don't want to know. I don't want to be exposed. The reality is the cleansing power of the blood of Christ. Every time I come to him, say, yes, Lord. Lord, I agree with you. I admit to you what you're saying to me is true. I need you. Lord, would you forgive me? He is willing to throw away my sin every time. It's amazing, folks, to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Everything that is contrary to God's standards of what is good, what is based on his character, conforming to his righteousness. And that's a beautiful truth, folks. For some reason in our world today, we seem to have lost sight of the reality of sin. We seem to have diminished. And folks, please understand what I'm saying. I don't want to focus on sin. 
I want to focus on our Lord. But I want to admit sin. Do you catch the difference? It's one thing to admit something. It's another thing to focus and be consumed by it. We admit it and then we move on. We focus on the Lord because we want to walk with him. We want to experience the freedom that we have in Christ, which is from him, which he actually wants for us. And that's essential for believers to understand. Would you close your eyes and bow your heads with me for a moment?